brothers and sisters. Today we have the gospel of the wedding feast. It's a great, wonderful gospel which follows behind the gospel that we had last Sunday of the wicked tenants who acted in a very similar way to reject the messengers that were sent to them by the landlord uh, at harvest time. And today we have the gospel of the wedding feast which repeats the, some of the same themes. Uh, the wedding feast we know is like the gospel of the uh, that wicked tenants is an allegorical story which is designed to teach us and to, in a way, provoke us into a more true and authentic uh, manner of Christian life. And the wedding feast uh, reminds us allegorically, obviously, of the consummation of all things. It, it refers, of course, uh, to the end of the world and to the completion uh, of God's work in the kingdom of heaven, uh, the fullness of our joy and our uh, sharing in the divine life that we are created for uh, at that time. Uh, we will all be invited to sup at this great table for this great feast. It also refers then accordingly, not just to the future, but to the present as well. Because as you know, uh, we are not just simply waiting patiently for the end of the world and for uh, life eternal, but we are also charged with a certain experience of those same things here and now. And we are uh, responsible for that, to live in a manner that is conducive to that. And that is where this story uh, becomes so interesting because obviously those who were invited uh, had no interest in participating in that great wedding banquet. And they acted very badly and were dealt with accordingly. But the, the, the doors, in a sense, were then thrown open, and everyone was invited in. Uh, the king insisted that his uh, subjects go out and compel uh, everyone they met to come and partake of this meal. And it seems a little unfair then that the king, uh, entering the hall, and finding someone who is not properly attired uh, would throw him out because this person obviously was not anticipating uh, the invitation uh, to come to this feast. He was, wherever he was, perhaps he was working uh, and suddenly was commanded to come to this feast. He obeyed and he came to the feast and now he is being thrown out of the feast bound hand and foot because he was not properly attired. Seems a little unfair, to, doesn't it, that he, he should have gotten a chance to go home and change, perhaps, or something. Uh, and then the gospel ends with this very um, difficult uh, saying, the invited are many, but the elect are few. And I think that here is the clue for us uh, to interpret or to understand this very strange uh, turn of events at the end of the story. Because um, even though they were unexpecting to be invited to this wedding uh, event, uh, some were attired properly and others were not. So the allegory of the story involves this question of wedding garment. And what does that mean? What does it represent to us? Some people may feel, well, the wedding garment, the appropriate attire to be at this feast, must represent a good 
moral life. You know, someone who is of clean disposition, who does the right things, who is upright, uh, proper in their behavior, uh, will, be, will be allowed to stay because they have the quote-unquote correct garment on. Whereas those who have uh, a sort of a spotty record, uh, well, they don't have that. Uh, alternatively, we might think that the, the wedding garment represents um, our ascetical life to the extent that we subjugate our own desires and our own uh, will and uh, embark on a, a struggle with ourselves and with our own, the limitations of our humanity, which is important, just as having a clean and good moral disposition is important. Uh, perhaps we might think that the ascetical life of the Christian is the garment according to which we will be identified. And uh, we could look at other things. Perhaps we might think that the garment would be to the extent that we are familiar with the Holy Scriptures, uh, that we have memorized these things and, they ha and have them, in a sense, written on our heart. Another thing that we could do as Christians that is extremely important and exemplary. But at the end, I, I feel that these, these answers are lacking in some way. They're all good answers to a certain degree, but they don't really hit the nail on the head. And I think that the answer for us as to what the wedding garment is, is revealed, uh, it could be revealed in many, many things. You know, and we could take this further, uh, care for the poor, uh, treatment of our brothers and sisters, uh, compassion, on and on and on. But uh, rather than looking at specific things like that, I think the answer is more general, that, uh, and it is explained to us perhaps in the cross, which is presented to us uh, this Sunday following the great and holy feast of the exaltation, which we served uh, earlier this week. And the cross is that kind of um, conundrum. It is the thing that doesn't make sense in, in a very worldly way. It was an instrument of death, but by accepting that death in a completely different way than uh, we would probably react where we in, the, in that position. Uh, but by accepting that death, Christ our Lord was able to transform it and, and change it so that it became effective and showed, showed us a better way. A better way than to cling to the thing that we want stubbornly. He relinquished it. He gave up his life. And in doing so, became the source of life for the whole world. Uh, as we know from that famous uh, quote, uh, if, you, if, if we want to have e eternal life, we have to die as a seed dies uh, first, and then be brought back to life. Uh, and and it is, that is the sort of the inner kernel, the mystery of the cross itself, uh, which uh, radically changes everything in our lives, so that we are no longer bound by the passions and passionate cravings and passionate behavior, so that we are, we, we are given the possibility to experience true freedom, uh, freedom of action, the freedom of intent. Uh, it, it is our responsibility then, brothers and sisters, not to wait until we get the tap on the door that says, the wedding feast is about to begin, and you are invited, you are uh, demanded to be there. It's, it's, our responsibility isn't to just be, to be laying in wait, but we need to be, the, and that's why we have this gospel, to, to warn us, to caution us, that we need to be prepared, we need to be ready, we need to anticipate, yes, the wedding feast is going to come, and we will be invited to it. 
and we will have to be properly attired. Uh, and so the attirement, the, the adornment of our clothing then at these feasts is all of these things that we mentioned, but they are all subsumed under the embracing of the cross, the entrance into the Christian life, the fulfillment of everything uh, that God has created us to be so that we, uh, we become who we are. And, and no longer are we uh, caught unawares. No longer are we just waiting patiently for that fulfillment which will surely come in the future, in the end of the world, the parousia uh, and the, the great uh, completion that, that will be revealed in God's kingdom. But we are also aware that that experience and that moment is shared with us to a degree right now, right in this instance and through the life of the church through the sacraments, and especially through the Eucharist, uh, we begin, we, we have a foretaste of that. And it is for that that we must prepare ourselves every day and every minute of every day so that our lives will be shaped by that offering. And we will unite ourselves to that offerer who gives of himself everything for the sake and for the life of the world. Amen. Let us say with all our soul and with all our mind that